Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, I am Tammy Franks, and on behalf of the National Child Passenger Safety Board, I'd like to thank you for joining us for the CEU webinar, Leaving on a Jet Plane and Bringing the Kids with Me. So thank you so much for entering in the chat box where you're from. It's been kind of fun traveling over the last 10 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to go ahead and mute my camera, but I just wanted to say hi, as our co-presenter as well wanted to say hi. Okay. So as a reminder, this is a CEU webinar. Uh, so in order to earn the CEU, you must attend at least 45 minutes of the webinar. So as I indicated, I am Tammy Franks, and I am a member of the National Child Passenger Safety Board. But please note today that I'll be presenting, representing the National Safety Council, where I serve as the Senior Program Manager for Transportation Safety Curricula. I'm joined today by Sarah Haverstick, the Safety Advocate for Good Baby International. And this is a presentation that we originally uh, presented in 2017. And by request, we've dusted it off and updated it for you and uh, for today. As we get started, uh, I just need to share a few disclaimers with you. Uh, please note that I do not have any affiliation with the child restraint manufacturer that Sarah Haverstick has an affiliation with Good Baby International. Any uh, child restraint systems, car seats uh, uh, pictured in this presentation are included for demonstration purposes and do not represent product endorsement. And finally, the focus of this presentation is on domestic travel today and not international travel. That'll be part two. So our objectives today are to gain an understanding of the FAA's position and supportive reasoning on traveling with children. We'll explain the MACPS's position on traveling with conventional car seats. We'll identify technical specifications and installation issues when using conventional car seats and identify seating options for flying with children with special transportation needs. Okay, and I'll now turn it over to Sarah. All right, we're going to start the presentation just with a little bit of research um, to kind of give us a background on what does this look like flying with kids, how many people are doing it, um, and what are those injuries that we see. So this was some research uh, that was published back in 2019. Uh, in terms of in-flight injuries, we're seeing about 250 pediatric in-flight injuries every year. And I think all of us know, you know, when we talk about using a car seat on a plane, often you'll see the comments from, care, from parents, you know, if there's a crash, what is that car seat going to do? We know that we aren't using those car seats on the aircraft for that big catastrophic crash situation. There's plenty of things that can happen on the ground or in the air that have the potential to cause injury and in fact do with about 250 injuries per year. Uh, they found that 35% of all those pediatric injuries occur for kids under the age of two. We're gonna see if this is gonna cooperate with letting me, there we go. Uh, out of all of those kids, the unrestrained lap children are more prone to in-flight injuries. That's what they found during this research, uh, looking at actual injuries that happened. Uh, and these are where they happen. Obviously there's turbulence. And the big issue with turbulence is especially clear air turbulence. If you've flown a lot and you've been through any of the clear air turbulence, it's pretty scary because it happens out of the blue. You have no idea that all of a sudden this is going to happen um, and there's you know, a drop in the cabin, you know, the, the aircraft experiences this turbulence that they couldn't have warned you about. So if you had a lap child in that situation, it's not like you were preparing for turbulence in that moment. You didn't know it was going to happen. And they see injuries, especially in that situation. But there's lots of other just common things that can happen. If you've got that lap baby and somebody is handing a hot coffee to another uh, occupant of your row and they accidentally hit a bump and the coffee spills on your child, there's potential for burn injuries. Uh, if you're sitting in that aisle seat, there's aisle traffic, there's meal service, lots of opportunities for kids to get pinched and bumped. And then, especially when you're sitting in that aisle seat, you're basically right below the opening to the overhead bins. And there's always the opportunity that something could happen, that overhead bin pops open and something can fall on the child. And those are not just maybe could happen. These are all injuries that have been documented in flight for kids. So 
So CHIPS, the Center for Child Injury Prevention Studies, uh, is an injury uh, consortium. So they are an academic and industry consortium that's comprised of a number of different academic institutions, but also members from NHTSA, members from the FAA, as well as members from uh, actual manufacturing companies that help to contribute to different research on injury topics. And this year, working with the member from the FAA, they actually said, well, let's look at child restraint use on aircraft and let's specifically talk to some flight attendants and see what flight attendants have to say about their perspective on kids coming into the aircraft and using car seats. Not surprisingly, the flight attendants, so they had actual in-person focus groups. This was pre-COVID. Uh, they really felt like parents didn't understand many of these in-air safety risks. So those things that we just talked about that are actually documented injury areas. I mean, these flight attendants are on the plane all day long, they see these things happen. So it's not just a number on paper, this is stuff that they have witnessed happen and they don't think parents really have much idea of that. They also felt like there was a discord between the priorities of what the parents want for that child and the safety rules that have to be enforced by the airline. And they felt like the parents didn't really fully understand the flight attendant's role in safety. So often people think of flight attendants as you know, a glorified, server up in the air, you know, bringing you your coffee and your snacks, but really flight attendants have a very important safety role on that aircraft, and they didn't feel like parents really understood that portion of their job. So here's some quotes directly from the focus groups. Uh, the first person says, I think the general flying public has just this lack of education. There's a level of ignorance. Flight attendants have seen these things that the general public hasn't. Another person says they actually spend time talking to their friends and family and encouraging them to buy a seat for kids on the plane, uh, but they don't feel like it's appropriate for them to deliver these messages to someone on the plane. Uh, so they don't feel like, like maybe that's stepping outside of their role. This one I thought was interesting. So they found that, you know, in their experience, the parents, especially with the lap held babies, are more interested in keeping that baby quiet and comfortable. So as the flight attendant is briefing them on what they need to do during take, during taxi, during takeoff, during turbulence, uh, if the baby happens to be lying down, sleeping, they're comfortable, they really feel like the parent isn't interested in doing the thing that would be safe for that child. They just want to keep that child comfortable and quiet. So often the airlines, the FAA, Transport Canada, all of these groups get called out for not being um, as concerned about the safety of the child when in reality this flight attendant felt like the parents are really the ones wagering with the safety of their baby. So interestingly, C-CHIPS also then did a survey of parents online to say, well, what are parents saying about this? How do they feel? They had almost 800 participants and almost 30% of those folks had used a car seat on a flight before. You know, probably about the number that you would expect knowing that many parents take the opportunity not to have to pay for that ticket or not to lug the car seat around. Under the age of two, only 19% of those folks had used a car seat. Over the age of two, it was about 37%. And these are what some of the parents had said. Uh, flight attendants and other passengers give me a hard time for using that car seat on the plane. I think probably all of us have heard that a little bit. It's a hassle to carry the car seat on and off the plane, especially during the layovers. And it's true. I mean, car seats are big and bulky and you need to do a little bit of extra planning for the logistics around how am I going to move things from point A to point B? How am I going to get the kid and the car seat and all of our luggage down the air, down the row in the aircraft to get to where we need to go? So it certainly is something additional that a parent has to plan for. And then this one, I'll never try to use a car seat on the plane again. It was bonkers. There's no room. It's awkward carrying my own stuff and my kid and then the diaper bag and the full size car seat. And it's just ridiculous. I think that is likely a parent who hasn't actually attempted to do this before, but this is what people think. You know, these are the parents that are planning a trip and going, are you out of your mind? I'm not gonna bring that car seat. That's way too much work. That's, it's so big, it's so heavy. How am I going to do this? And I think that's the message that a lot of parents end up with, you know, not understanding what those safety concerns are and just kind of seeing that this is a big hassle in this already really stressful kind of travel environment. So you know, following on that, we see that you know parents will 
often ask questions uh, as they prepare for the travel. Maybe they've heard from friends some of the concerns that Sarah just shared with you. And they might ask, you know, do I really have to buy a ticket for my baby? And, or, you know, uh, can I take my car seat or not? Do I, do I have to bring a car seat? And then what is safer? If I'm bringing my car seat, do I check it as luggage? Do I use it at the gate? Cause I sure don't, or check it at the gate, but I sure don't want to have to take it onto the plane. Um, or maybe it's a child who has special needs and what can they use on the airplane? And then, you know, even if, well, if I don't bring my own seat, if I use one from a rental company, a rental car company, are they really safe? So these are questions that you may have received uh, as a technician or may even have your, as yourself uh, as a caregiver. And I did a quick a Google search uh, prior to uh, or, or in preparing this webinar. And, you know, we know that sometimes the sources that we find um, online are more credible than others. Um, and, you know, here are a few that I found um, that I would probably call misinformation uh, that about flying with children. Um, and it could be somebody who is very well intended, um, but maybe it didn't have the facts. And so hopefully, uh, well, when you leave today, you'll have some of the facts and, and we can help share a little bit more accurate information. So, you know, some of the online advice was uh, you have to purchase a seat for your child, regardless of his or her age. Um, while that may be best practice, we'll see if that's indeed true. Um, this one, um, if you check your car seat as luggage, it must be boxed in the original box in which you purchased it. Oh my goodness, the panic that that uh, can instill in a caregiver. Do they have the original box? Was it long ago recycled or became a castle or a fort in the living room? Or you can't check your car seat as luggage. If the bag handlers drop it, it's been crashed and you cannot use it anymore. Well, how are you gonna determine that as a caregiver? So let's, uh, Let's work through this and see who says what about flying with children. We're gonna go right to the sources. So the first uh, source that we'll start with is the Federal Aviation Administration. That seems to make sense. <laughs> so uh, that, or we often refer to them as the FAA. And this is reflective of the information that you'll find in the 2020 National CPST Certification Training Technician Guide in, modules 11, in Module 11. So pages 11.5 through 11.6, if you need this information and wanna share it with families, uh, again, you have that resource uh, either online at cpsboard.org, um, or uh, you can, uh, or if you have a print copy, it's also there. So what does the FAA say? Well, the FAA uh, indicates that the safest place for a child is in a government approved, which means it meets the applicable uh, motor or the applicable federal safety standards, car seat um, or device, but not on your lap. So you know, they're telling you that your arms aren't capable of holding your child securely especially during unexpected turbulence. The FAA additionally strongly um, urges you to secure a child in a car seat uh, for the duration or some type of device approved for use on aircraft for the duration of the flight. They do prohibit the use of booster seats, harness vests, belly belts during ground movement, takeoff and landing, but interestingly enough, there's no regulatory prohibition from using these products for a lap child during the cruise portion of the flight only. But it's important to check with airlines. They may have their own policies uh, about whether or not uh, these types of devices can be used in flight. So why is this? Why doesn't the FAA require you to use um, a car seat. So for the for children under two, they allow the child to be a lap child. Um, and part of the reasoning was that a mandate would require parents to purchase an extra airline ticket for their child, forcing some families who can't afford the extra ticket to drive, which would be a strategic, st statistically, sorry, more dangerous way to travel. And we provided the site there for you so that you know uh, where this information comes from, because we often hear this. Um, and I think it's important to know the study that it comes from. You can see that was from 2003. Now, that may be some of the reasoning, but we also know um, as we move through this, we'll be seeing, we'll be talking about you know, good, better, and best. What is best practice and how do we share it and what information should we share with families? The FAA does have a tip sheet 
uh, the site is there for you at faa.gov forward slash travelers forward slash fly underscore children. And just wanted to share that and point out that the the information on their social media icons uh, for their to their site uh, is, is the link is broken, uh, but they haven't updated their social media images. So um, if you're looking for the information, you know, I would just type in flying with children and FAA and you can get this great fact sheet that you can share with parents and caregivers as well. There's some good reminders on there, such as um, the width of the, the airplane seat versus the car seat, um, talking about um, like discounted fares, uh, those types of pointers. And we'll go over some of this uh, throughout the presentation, but I did want to let you know of that resource. Another resource is the American Academy of Pediatrics. And in their travel safety tips on the AAP.org, they do recommend that a child is best protected when using a approved, a federally approved car seat appropriate for their age, weight, and height. Uh, for children over 40 pounds, they indicate that they can use the aircraft seat belt, which we know is a lap belt. And that families should explore options to ensure that each child has their own seat. So if you're flying with that under two baby, that could be a lap baby. Um, and if it's not feasible to buy a ticket so that child has their own seat, the AAP encourages you to try to find a time where there might be a little bit less full on the airplane uh, and there might be an empty seat where your child could ride buckled in their car seat. I know that's a little bit harder. Uh, our airlines are getting better and better with filling the flights. Um, and so this may be a little bit more difficult for families than it was in the past. The National Transportation Safety Board since 1979 has issued safety recommendations asking the FAA to require children under age two to be appropriately secured in their child restraint in their own seat. So they encourage, the NTSB encourages you to buy a ticket for all children less than two years and restrain them in, an, in the child restraint system certified for use on the aircraft. Uh, and this is during all portions of the flight. So takeoff, taxiing, landing, uh, and in-flight. And then finally, the Manufacturers Alliance of Child Passenger Safety also has a harmonized statement from August of 2012 on flying uh, with car seats. So the MACPS does encourage all caregivers to withstand most, um, to, excuse me, uh, to secure children in their own car seats secured correctly um, on their own airline seat. So they do indicate that caregivers have the option to check uh, a car seat with the gate agent to, um, or to check with the gate agent to make certain, to see if there's any vacant seats to secure a car seat. Um, but they also indicate that uh, if a car seat is gate checked or checked as luggage, that they, they do not consider the, the, any type of force from dropping um, equivalent to that, that would be in a motor vehicle crash. So it's important for caregivers to check the car seat uh, once they have arrived at their destination and make sure there's no visible damage and that all aspects of the car seat function properly. So as you can see, there's lots of information from many credible sources. But overall, stressing the importance of using a car seat in flight. So now we're going to talk about the options. So what are all those different options? And remembering, as Tammy mentioned, good, better, best is that mantra that we teach in the certification course. And we want to keep that in our mind as we're going through all these different transportation options as well, because we can't realistically expect every caregiver to follow that best practice recommendation. So it's important that we understand all of the available transportation options for kittens. So your first option is, you know, obviously you can check that product and, you know, gate checking would be uh, for those that don't travel a lot, you can luggage check right at the counter as soon as you walk in. If you're gate checking, it means you're carrying that product all the way through the airport with you. And when you get to your gate to actually board your plane, you're able to check that luggage there as well. That's generally what folks will do with strollers. So that way you have that stroller come right off the plane with you when you get to your destination as well. Typically there's no additional charge to do this, but there's not necessarily 
any more any additional safety either, you know, gate checking versus luggage checking. I know that question comes up a lot. I think any of us that have seen luggage handled uh, know that there is a certainly a risk for damage no matter what you do, whether you're gate checking it or whether you're luggage checking it, there's always that risk that something can happen. This picture is my daughter. I think she was five or six at the time. And it was one of the first flights we did uh, where she was already a booster user. She called herself a booster seat person uh, and she was going to be traveling with it. So we carried it on. And I remember the gate agent stopping us and saying, you know, you can't use that on the aircraft, right? And I like beamed and was so excited and probably a little overly enthusiastic in chatting with the gate agent about that afterwards, but said, no, 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 we're just going to take it with us and put it in the overhead bin. So that's one option. You know, if you've got a booster age kiddo, you know, you need something at your destination. You can always place something in the overhead bin too, a little less risk for damage in that situation. And with this, since she was still a new-ish booster user at this point, uh, we, I wanted her to still use the back while we were traveling, we were gonna be away for like a week, we'd be in the car a lot. So I took the back off and I actually was able to fit it in my suitcase and then stuffed it with all the clothes that we were packing anyway. Uh, so it felt like it was pretty well padded in there and I felt more comfortable checking that in that situation and still certainly reviewed it pretty closely uh, when it came to me after you know we got it out of the luggage just to make sure no foam had broken, everything looked like it was in good working order. So we did that little inspection and then at least we had the back to go with it as well, which was nice. But you can luggage check, you know, if you're going to check it anyway, it seems like a lot of work to carry it through the airport. And if you're going to check it, you know, if you luggage check it, that's something that you're doing right there at check in as soon as you get to the airport. Uh, again, generally airlines will allow you to do that and they won't count it as an extra luggage item. They won't charge you as extra luggage with that. However, they will make you sign your life away because they are going to not uh, occur, incur any of the liability of potential damage to your product. So for any of that baby gear stuff, they will have you sign a waiver to say you understand this could be broken and it could not maybe end up at your final destination when you need it to. Uh, so that's you know a risk that you're taking in choosing to check this type of item. There are some car seat manufacturers that now have different types of travel bags available and sometimes have different programs that go with it. So on the left, you can see the Upper Baby bag. This is for the Mesa. Uh, and if you register both your gear and the bag, any damage caused by travel is covered by EPA under the terms of your original warranty for that gear. So, you know, if you have an EPA product, that would be useful to know if you were going to go ahead and check that seat. Uh, the PIPA now has a new travel bag. So you see that on the right hand side, and that actually extends the car seat warranty by a year if any damage occurs during travel. So useful to know about those programs. Kleck also has a travel bag called the Wheelie, and it, this is directly from their product instructions. You'll see they do encourage consumers to use the product on the aircraft whenever possible, but they note that if it is necessary to check the seat, it must be packed in a Kleck Wheelie travel bag, uh, which is sold separately from their product. So they're encouraging their consumers to use the bag that they've created that they know properly fits their product and has additional packing material in it as well. So your options then, you know, you've got that child under two and if you decided you were checking that bag and you didn't purchase them a ticket, your option is to hold them as a lap infant and a lap baby. As Tammy mentioned, this is permitted. Uh, all of us are recommending, this is obviously not best practice, we're recommending that you would take that car seat on the plane, you would purchase that ticket for the child under two. Uh, but in reality, we know that that doesn't happen. The big call out here um, is that a child under two needs to be able to provide proof of age. The airline obviously doesn't want people abusing this system and saying, well, my four-year-old is really, really small and we're just going to have them pass as, you know, being under two. Uh, so they do require proof of age, which generally has to do, um, I would always carry, even when I brought, bought purchased a ticket for my child. Under two, I always brought a copy of the birth certificate just to have it in case anybody asked, because I have seen people crying at the counter because they didn't have something to prove the child's age. 
<laughs> the best practice option for these kids under two is that you purchase the seat and uh, that gets them into a car seat in their own separate seat. It keeps them safe. And in my experience, it keeps them pretty happy in the plane too, which is nice. It's always worth calling the airline to see if there is an option for a reduced price fare. Uh, they do often offer infant and child fares. Uh, usually that's not something you're going to find on their website. It is something you would have to call the airline about. Uh, but also in my experience, you can usually find better prices online if they have different deals and promotions running. So it's worth checking both and calling them to find out what that infant fare would be uh, and checking to see what they do have available online. And as I said, even though I did this with all of my kids, uh, I always still brought their birth certificate, a copy of it with me just in case. So if anybody asked, I could show how old the kid was. So when we decide that we are going to put the child in a car seat on the plane, we have a few different options. You have a traditional conventional car seat, so we'll talk through those. Uh, we do have the CARES harness, which is the only of those, you know, Tammy mentioned the harness or vest was not approved, but the CARES harness we know is something that is approved. So we'll talk about that. And then obviously you have just that lap belt that's available on the aircraft. So in terms of car seats, first, let's start with, you know, how do we know that a car seat is approved for use on an aircraft? And how do we as manufacturers determine that that car seat can be used on the aircraft? Uh, and that's something that's part of 213 and it's aircraft certification testing. So this is a pre-test setup picture. So you can see we've got an infant car seat. Uh, this is that larger three-year-old dummy. So it's the larger of the infant or the larger of the dummies that we will put in an infant seat for testing. That's why it looks a little weird and is a little big for the product. Uh, but basically we're going to now rotate this fixture 35 to 45 degrees per second to an angle of 180 degrees. So basically we're going to rotate it upside down. We often call this the inversion test. And this is what it looks like at the peak. So once you rotate it around at the specified speed, then we have to hang the product in this position for three seconds. So it holds here and you know that you've passed the test if the car seat uh, does not fall out of the safety belt of the aircraft restraint or the test dummy does not fall out of the car seat during the rotation or this three second hanging period. So that's what that looks like. If we can pass this, which most products will, uh, then we're able to put the statement on the product that says the product is certified for use in aircraft. But there's other considerations too. If you're thinking about bringing that car seat on, the aircraft environment is much different than the vehicle seating environment. So it's useful to you know, think about what is the size of my car seat and realistically, is this going to be easy to travel with? And am I going to be able to fit it on the aircraft and fit it at the appropriate recline on the aircraft? Uh, so good news for us flying public is that the FAA now requires that airlines provide seating information on their website primarily for consumers that are trying to fly with a child. Uh, so they have to post their seat dimensions, the width of that seat. They usually also have the pitch, which is the distance between uh, one seat and another seat, so that you can kind of get an idea of whether or not your product is actually going to fit. This car seat must be in a seat position that has an upright seat back. So, you know, every time before takeoff and landing, those flight attendants are doing their safety job, walking through the cabin, making sure all of the aircraft seat are in the upright seating position. So that's how you need to install your car seat. And generally, you're going to need to place that car seat near the window seat. The idea there is that car seat cannot impede the emergency egress of another passenger. So if somebody needs to get off the aircraft in a hurry, they certainly don't need to be doing that, trying to climb over your rear facing convertible seat with your child in it. Uh, so car seats have to go towards the sides of the aircraft on the window sides um, so that any other passenger is able to get out easily. Now, I think if you're traveling by yourself with maybe two kids in tow with two car seats, um, I've definitely seen where some airlines have allowed you to use the window seat and the center seating position, but I think a lot of that is likely up to the discretion of the flight crew that you're working with. Um, so, you know, kindness always rules pretty well. So, you know, just talk with the folks that are, you know, the gate agents, talk with the flight crew when you get on board, if that was the situation, um, just to see what they would allow in that, in that situation with one adult and multiple kids. 
One of the big no-nos is you cannot place a car seat in, a non, in an emergency row. Uh, so you have to be using one of the non-emergency rows on the aircraft. The folks sitting in those emergency rows have a really important job and it can't be somebody that also needs to tend to a child and help somebody else get off the aircraft. This is an example from the Southwest website where they are now required to provide this information to you. Now you'll note the narrowest seat width here is at 15 and a half inches and the widest is almost 18 inches. That's not terribly wide. And if you think through dimensions of car seats you've worked with before, most of them are you know, in the 17 to 18 inch range and often wider than that. I've always found that it helps if you can raise the armrest between two seats, so between that window seat and the center seat, and then install the car seat with that hand rest or the armrest in the upright position. That seems to help a lot with the width. And then I just kind of use the car seat as my own personal armrest. Just some more information. Usually when I look for this information on airline websites, you know, I'll just type in car seat or child restraint or uh, seat dimensions and you know some kind of combination of those words usually gets you to the information that you need uh, and then you know note that southwest here also says you can always reach out to customer support too so that they can give you that information as well It is important to know if you have paid for that ticket for your child. So even if they're under two, if you've paid for a ticket for them uh, and your car seat is not fitting in, you know, if you're on a plane where you have an assigned seat, your car seat isn't fitting in the seating position in which you're assigned. The airline is responsible for accommodating that car seat in another seat in the same class of service. So if maybe you have an armrest that isn't able to move up and get out of the way so that you can actually install and fit your car seat on that seating surface, uh, they would be able to hopefully move you to a different seating position. Additionally, I've often run across, you know, concerns about rear facing kids uh, and impeding the ability of the person in front of that rear facing occupants to recline their seat during travel. Uh, so sometimes I've had to strategically place my own family members so that I can place a rear facing car seat there. I usually, I don't think they say as much about it with an infant car seat, but if you're going to bring on the convertible or all in one, you know, this bigger bulkier seat, it's likely that the flight attendant will say something about, you know, how you're using that product and whether you should be using it rear facing or forward facing. The number one tip I give to a friends and family that are traveling is to know where this label is located on your car seat. So per the federal regulation, we have to in red text on a label on the car seat state our certification for the product. So you can see it down at the bottom of this key fit label. Uh, this restraint is certified for use in motor vehicles and aircraft know where this label is on the product so that if the gate agent or if any of the flight crew stop you and say, hey, are you sure that air, that is allowed to be used on the plane, you can point to that label and definitively say, yes, it is approved for use on the plane. But just because we can allow you to use it on the plane doesn't mean we will always allow you to use it on the plane. Uh, so you always want to make sure you understand any restrictions around your product. And in this case, this is the Evenflow Gold Revolve 360. <clears throat> it's an all-in-one car seat. It has harness modes. It's got booster mode. We know that we can't use a booster on the aircraft, but in this case, we tell you this restraint is not certified for use in aircraft, period. And it's not because we can't pass that inversion test. It's because the installation for this product is a little bit different. And that aircraft environment is different. The seatbelt is different. Think of where that big buckle ends up in the center of the seating position versus where the buckle would be in a motor vehicle. It can cause some challenges with different products and the way that they need to install. Uh, so in this case, we tell you just don't do it because we think that's better ultimately for the consumer. This I like, this came from the Costco Mighty Fit 65 and in their product instructions under aircraft information, not only you know, do they give you the aircraft info, but they also state that some airlines may want to see this label that we're talking about and they show you in a little diagram exactly where that label is located. So that's really helpful for the consumer, you know, hopefully they're reading their product instructions uh, and it's helpful to see exactly where on the product you can find that label. As mentioned, you know, you really do need to pay attention specifically to what this label says. And I've run into 
confusion with friends who aren't technicians, who aren't as well versed in this, when they see a label like this. So this says the child restraint is certified for use in aircraft in harness mode. And then right below it, it says not certified for use in booster mode. Well, we all understand why that is. We have no lap shoulder belts in that aircraft, so we can't use a booster seat on the aircraft. Uh, but if you see this and you get confused and then the flight attendant asks you and they see the part that says not approved, confusion ensues and then nobody knows what to do and then you end up having to check your luggage and check your car seat as luggage right there which you didn't intend to do so it's important to help consumers understand there are different modes of use for some products and sometimes you can use it in one but not the other so this would be the case with this all in one Infant car seats are also a good one to pay attention to because they often have different requirements and it's not necessarily uniform across brands or uniform across uh, even within individual brands. So on the left hand side, we see the Graco Snug Ride Snug Lock, super popular infant seat, and it says it's certified for use in aircraft when used without the base. So if you're traveling with that product, you can take it, you can use it without the base, you could continue to use it without the base in all of your travels when you get to your destination, uh, or you could check the base if you wanted to, you could put it in luggage if you wanted to, you can do what you need to do if you wanted to bring that base, but you cannot use the base on the aircraft. <clears throat> the new Nuna Pippa Light RX does allow use in aircraft and says it can be used with or without the base. So either way, you're approved and no matter whichever way the family wants to do it, they're able to use either way. However, the original Nuna Pippa light uh, could only be used with the base because if you remember the original Nuna Pippa light doesn't have belt guides on the carrier, so there's no way to install it without using that base. Some aircraft do have inflatable seatbelts. <clears throat> so that's another important consideration, you know, why it's always good to check in with the airline if you have assigned seats to figure out what type of seating position you have in that aircraft. And in this case, in the Britax, Britax Be Safe 35, they note that inflatable aircraft are not compatible. So if you end up in one of those seating positions, that would be one of those times where you would either need to change to a different seating position within that cabin of service, uh, or you might need to consider a different child restraint to use if that was your only option, if they even if any child restraint would allow that use. So that's where some upfront work uh, and some upfront investigating of what is allowed on that aircraft is probably useful. In this case, the Summer Affirm 335 gives instruction on where to place their handle. Uh, and most manufacturers will do this. They'll tell you which handle position is appropriate, but that's an important consideration when you're on the aircraft as well. In this case, you can see Summer allows it in the carry position number two or in the forward position number one, uh, but not in three or four. Presumably, often thinking of the pitch, that distance between the seats, in position three, it's often hard to get the handle to lock in that position on an aircraft because you run into that seat in front of you. Uh, and then if you can't get to position three, you're not gonna be able to get down to position four either. Uh, so they're giving you that guidance because they know what is or is not going to work for their product on an aircraft. Another one that's a little bit unique if you've worked with SensorSafe from Evenflow or Cybex, uh, our SensorSafe technology, which is incorporated into the chest clip of the product, actually becomes a portable electronic device in terms of the FAA regulation. So you know they always tell you before takeoff and landing that you have to turn off your portable electronic devices. Uh, so in this case, we instruct consumers to place the child in the seat to get them nice and secured in that harness, get the harness snug, and then before takeoff or before landing to unclip that chest clip uh, before use so that it's no longer functional as a portable electronic device. It's a great idea to check the car seat instruction manual for hints. We always want consumers to thoroughly review those car seat instructions, but we often, you know, we want to make this easier for you. We try to make things um, and to write things in a way to help consumers with their installations. Uh, so many brands will provide a tip telling you to contact your airline to make sure that your restraint is going to meet whatever their specific requirements are as well. Uh, so that's always a good one to remember. 
<clears throat> but for Evenflow, we also tell you that for any forward facing installations, it's okay to pad the back area of the car seat. Because if you think again about the way that that aircraft seatbelt works, that the metal buckle ends up right in the middle of your back or right in the middle of that belt path. And if you have a seat with an open belt path, that means it's really sitting right in the middle of the kid's back. And depending on the length of your flight could be really uncomfortable. So in that situation, we allow you to cushion that area. You know, you can stick a little pillow, a blanket, a sweatshirt, you know, something back there behind the child uh, as you're harnessing them in the seat. Obviously, that's not something that we're going to allow in a vehicle, but an aircraft is a different environment than a vehicle. So we do make that allowance here. Uh, this is the Orbit Baby G5 infant seats, and they recommend uh, if you need to ask the flight attendant for a belt extender. And, you know, a lot of people that fly might not even know that this belt extender exists, but if you find that the aircraft belt is too short to fit in your car seats and it's not working through the belt path, you can always ask for that belt extender. I'd also say any seat that has a closed belt path, so plastic all the way around the belt path, not something where you're just lifting up soft goods and you can see the seatbelt visually. Uh, in those situations, it generally helps to ask for that seatbelt extender as well. So that way you're able to reach and, and you have access to the buckle outside of the belt path so that you can get it undone when you get to your destination. And the FAQs on our websites are always a really great resource too. So car seat manufacturers often put additional information in FAQs, uh, sometimes above what goes into product instructions, just to give a little bit more detail or to address specific situations. So in this case, Epa Baby has a question specifically about using the Mesa infant car seat on planes. So as technicians, you know, the FAQs are always a really great source to find additional information as well. So outside of conventional seats, we do have the CARES harness that is an approved harness system for aircraft. The child must be one or older. You can see the other specs on the screen. They have to be able to sit upright unassisted. And the drawback to this one is you can only use it on the aircraft. So this is something that you're going to invest in that you are only going to utilize while you are flying. The benefit is you can see that small inset picture. It's really tiny. It's super easy to pack, to carry, to travel with, uh, whatever you need. However, then you're still kind of stuck when you get to where you're going, what's your game plan? You know, we'll talk about that a little bit more in some more detail, but with this option, while great for not lugging a car seat through the airport, you do have to consider what is your option when you get to where you're going? How are you going to safely transport your child um, after you've used this on the aircraft? And then finally, you have your lap belt as an option. So this was Charlotte after she carried that uh, booster all the way down the jet bridge. She put it in the overhead and she was able to use the lap belt. Again, she was like five or six at this point. Uh, and they say, you know, it should fit most kids over 40 pounds. I think she was about 45 to 50 pounds here uh, and it fit really well. So uh, that's certainly an option, but is a better option when your child is over that weight range. Under that weight range, we know the belt is not likely to fit appropriately. So in this situation, like in a vehicle, the lap belt needs to be positioned snugly across your upper thighs, low on the hips, not going across the soft, squishy abdomen. Uh, and for younger kids, it's going to be harder to get that positioning, which again is why that, you know, car seat environment is such a good option for those young kids. And additionally, I've always found it's a comforting option. It's something that they're familiar with. My kids often fall asleep on the plane because they're used to sitting in that position and the big noises of the airplane aren't really so scary when you're in your own little environment too. So that's uh, another plus to bringing the air or bringing the car seat on the plane. Well, great. Thank you so much, Sarah. And so you know, following up on that, what do you do once you arrive at your destination? Well, some recommendations that we can make for families, you know, maybe they have a really heavy car seat and they're hesitant about lugging it through the airport, as we saw with the earlier comments. Maybe you can encourage them, um, as, as Sarah indicated earlier, you know, purchasing a more portable seat, something that could go up in the overhead compartment if they're not able to use it on the um, airplane seats uh, that they could use during travel, something that's easier to, to carry uh, and not quite as heavy, maybe one option. 
Another option would be to rent a car seat from a rental car company when you arrive at your destination. But there are some unknowns with doing this. Uh, we, we, you may not know the history of the car seat. Uh, you would hope that people would be honest um, if, it was, if they were involved in some type of crash with it um, and share that with the rental car company. Um, additionally, you might, you might not know how the product is being cleaned. So in terms of the cleaning products that are being used on the shell and on the harness and, and concerns with that. We do encourage families, if they are going to rent a car seat from a rental car company, to determine what type of car seat it is prior to, to uh, going and arriving at their destination so that they can review those car seat instruction manuals in advance, uh, as we always promote to read that manual. And then another consideration would be to have that backup plan. So you know, what happens if uh, your car seat doesn't arrive, uh, you gate checked it or you checked it as luggage, somebody shared, Claire shared, I'll never forget standing behind a young family who gate checked the car seat and stroller and only got the stroller after landing a direct flight. They were provided a loaner seat by the, air, by the airline, but the family was not familiar with the seat or the history or how to use it. And so again, really encouraging families to have that backup plan and know where the closest retail store is located or have family members. Uh, we have grandbabies coming to visit over the holidays and we'll have car seats waiting for them um, in the vehicle uh, when they arrive uh, so that they don't have to worry about that uh, gate checking them or um, checking them as luggage. So children with special transportation needs, let's spend a little bit of time uh, talking about that. And um, you know, one thing to remember is that as Sarah uh, shared earlier, that if you have purchased a seat, the airlines need to accommodate you in the same fare class uh, for with an airline, with a seat um, for that the car seat will fit for that person. So, uh, this, this is for any child under the age of 18, and this information is on the FAA website. So if you're working with families who have children with special needs, this may be helpful information for them to take with them uh, so that they have that to share with the airlines. Again, kindness goes a long way, as Sarah said, um, and it's important to advocate for your family, but also uh, you know, to, to do that as in, in a kind manner. So there are some many seating options available. Uh, we've talked through some conventional seats, but you'll also see a list of specialized car seats here. And by looking through this list, you can imagine that many of them are wider than that uh, 16 inches. <laughs> um, so again, just knowing um, the aircraft and how wide the seat is, and if you're gonna be able to fit the specialized car seat uh, on the, on the airplane seat. Uh, this is important information to research ahead of time. One seat that I want to talk about in particular is the Carrot 3. And so some of you may know it by, by uh, the name Convey, the manufacturer Convey. Uh, they're now in the process of switching over to using ETAC for all of their seats. Um, so this is the ETAC Carrot 3. Uh, where they refer to it, the manufacturer does, as a car seat. In essence, it, it's a booster seat. It has a harness, but it requires the use of a lap and shoulder belt. So that gets a little tricky for our aircraft. And so they have come up with a solution um, passing the inversion test. So you'll see here, they have what's called a fixing strap. And that is what you see on the left-hand side of the slide. And it has two buckles um, and then a strap. And what you, you need to put this onto the uh, Carrot 3 uh, prior to boarding the aircraft. Uh, you'll need to remove the head a restraint from the shell. Um, there's a, some release buttons similar to in a vehicle where you, you press release buttons. It lifts off. And then you take the circle end of those buckles and you slide it onto the post for the head restraint and then slide the head restraint back down. And you can see where the orange arrows are pointing that's showing you where those buckles um, are around the posts and being held in place on the back of the, the carrot three. I should note that uh, when you purchase these, uh, this fixing strap, you will receive an FAA certification sticker for your Carrot 3 saying that it's approved for use on aircraft. So it's important that families don't set that to the side, that they do uh, put that on the car seat or on the Carrot 3 um, as well so that they have that proof that it is approved for use on aircraft. 
When you use the carrot three with the fixing strap, you will you'll notice on the left image there that you will take that fixing strap and wrap it around the airline seat behind the child or um, wrap it around the back of the airline seat. It's important that the carrot three is flush against the aircraft seat. You'll then place the child in the harness and you'll tighten the harness and put the lap belt on the child through the, uh, the belt path. After the child is in the car seat uh, and you have tightened the lap belt, the manufacturer encourages you to check at the belt path and make certain that the, the seat moves no more than one inch side to side or front to back at the forward facing belt path. If it does, it's not installed tightly enough and you need to tighten the straps. So both the fixing strap and the lap belt uh, until you have no more than one inch of movement side to side and front to back at that belt path for the lap belt. Another option for children with special needs would be the CARES harness. And we talked earlier about the, Sarah mentioned it earlier, the CARES harness as a conventional seat. Well, it can also be used for children who have special transportation needs. And this chart comes from their website and it's super handy and helpful. So again, if you're meeting with families, this may be something that you wanna print off and share with them. Uh, you can see here in the first and second, or in the first column that the regular Regular CARES harness can be used. Typically, it's, it's rated for up to 44 pounds and 40 inches. But for flyers who are up to 56 inches tall, you can use the regular CARES harness with an FAA exemption. And I'll cover what that means in just a moment. Additionally, for flyers who are between five and six feet tall, uh, they will have, um, you can order a special CARES that has uh, an extender so that it fits better uh, around the children. Uh, I did just notice when I was preparing uh, right before this call that uh, if a child's between 56 and 60 inches, I'm not quite sure which one they should use and I didn't have a chance to reach out to the company. Uh, so if you look at their chart, goes to 56 and then 60 inches. So I'm sorry I didn't catch that beforehand, uh, but I would check with the manufacturer if you're working with a child who falls in that category. So if you are, if you do need to file for an FAA exemption, if you go to the CARES website, they actually walk you through the process. It's, it's a fantastic, they do a step-by-step -step for you. And then they have a request for an exemption here. So this is a request to use the CARES harness for, a, for the child restraint system for a larger or older person. So this could be, um, again, for that child who's using the, the conventional CARES or the special CARES. So when the FAA issues an exemption to this regulation, they grant it for a five-year period. And it's important that the, every time that traveler travels that they carry that exemption letter if they are using the CARES. Um, beyond the, the typical capacity of how it's labeled. So with that exemption. Additionally, the FAA three to four months before this exemption letter terminates will contact the person and, uh, and remind them to if they want to extend the exemption for another five years. So basically once this is done, uh, similar to your known traveler number, as long as you re-up it, uh, it will stay in effect, but it's important to take that documentation with you. I do encourage you to look at the, their website for the CARES Harness uh, just to see the process and the sample letter. Um, there's similar letters that if you do a search, internet search for that you can use if you have a family who needs to use the lay down, formerly called the modified Easy On Vest uh, on an airplane seat or on several airplane seats. Uh, they also have uh, a letter for that that you can use as an example as well uh, through an internet search. Okay, so at that point, at this point, we do have time for a few questions. Um, and before we do that, I just want to remind you that this webinar recording will be posted to cpsboard.org slash recertification if you'd like to share this with others. So Sarah, um, have you had a chance to look at some of the questions? Do you want me to do so? Oh, lots of comments. So there's a lot of good comments, uh, people chatting about experiences they've had. Um, 
one, I wanted to call out Catherine, our buddy up in Canada mentioned, and I will clarify that uh, the information we presented today is specific to domestic US travel. Uh, Canada, in terms of child restraints, they do require that all child restraints be aircraft certified. Uh, so if you're in Canada using the Evenflow Revolve, we do allow aircraft use then, and it's just some quirkiness with the regulations. But uh, today's information was specific to U.S. carriers and domestic travel. Great, thank you. And so did we get, were there any questions? Um, sorry, I looks like it was active on my last, uh, yeah, there were lots of really great comments about uh, different situations. Uh, Charles mentioned that parents may scrub off their labels. So it's important to make sure if a parent has ever taken uh, the label off of their product, that if they're planning to travel with it, they do need to have that label. So they should reach out to their manufacturer. Okay. And I see Amber asked, um, is there any requirement that allows airline to use an empty seat and offer to a family with a child or car seat? And I would encourage the family to check with the airline. Um, I think, I don't know that there's a requirement, uh, but it would be airline specific. Yeah, and usually when you check in, they can tell you if there's any empty seats available on the flight. So you generally will have a pretty good idea um, if there's going to be an option for you, but probably not going to know that until day of. Claire also asked about extended rear facing versus forward facing on a plane. You know, once you get into the bigger seats, um, those convertibles, the all-in-ones that you're trying to fit rear facing, with the pitch of that aircraft, it is highly unlikely you're going to get that seat really actually properly installed at an appropriate recline angle. Uh, and in my experience, that's when the flight attendants start to ask some questions. You know, does that child really need to be rear facing? Could you turn them forward facing? And remembering, you know, the things that we're trying to protect against in terms of injury metrics for that child, you know, it isn't the end of the world to turn them forward facing. And in our product instructions, we specifically note that FAA uh, recommendations may differ than what you would do in a motor vehicle. So while we talk extended rear facing a lot in terms of motor vehicle crashes and keeping kids protected in that situation, it's okay if you need to turn that seat forward facing on an airplane. It's really a very different environment uh, and you might find that the fit is better. Uh, it's nice when kids can stay rear facing because they do seem to be a little bit more comfortable sleeping, but if that really isn't an option, um, it's important for parents to know not to beat themselves up about that either, that you know, bringing the car seat on step one, that's your best practice and you're doing a really good thing there. And if you need to turn that car seat forward facing for your two-year-old who's normally rear facing in the vehicle, it's not the end of the world. And then Sarah, there's uh, one more here that from Catherine and I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is more about international travel. And what about bassinets that attach to the bulkhead of the plane given out by the airplane? Are they preferable to infant seats or the other way around or about the same? I do think that's more common in international travel. Um, so I'm not entirely certain and I haven't seen that in any domestic U.S. flights. Um, so again, I would chat with the airline to see what's going on and what your options are. It, you know, just thinking about it, I would always prefer to have a child in a harness situation. I'm not sure if the bassinets offer a harness and in uh, severe turbulence, you know, if they're just laying down in a bassinet that's not harnessed, I don't know what's holding them in, in, you know, a really turbulent situation. So I think the harness, you know, has a real benefit in that infant car seat. So I say uh, stay tuned for uh, flying with, with children uh, 2.0, and we'll look at international travel in the future. I, what a, and maybe we could do some research, Sarah. What do you think? That's, I think the research <laughs> needs to be a trip international. How's that? That was my, that was my hint. Um, and then just one more quickly, uh, and then um, I'll share. So uh, uh, it was Tracy. Sorry, my, I lost my, on my computer. Um, she asked if rear facing infant states still have to say rear facing regardless. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So a rear facing only seat needs to be rear facing on the aircraft. So when I said not the end of the world to turn around the kid, that's if you're in a convertible that is appropriate for use forward facing. So remember, you always have to follow the car seat manufacturer instructions too. And those instructions will include instructions on how to install the seat properly on an aircraft. 
Great, thank you, Sarah. And just quickly before we end today, I do wanna remind you uh, that the National Child Passenger Safety Board has two upcoming community education webinars. So I hope that you'll consider joining us on Tuesday, November 9th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Tabitha Harris from Oklahoma will be presenting a toolkit for tribal partnership development. And then uh, on the week later, on the 16th of November, uh, Ben Hoffman will be from Oregon Health Science and Science University will be presenting Where They Sleep Makes a Difference, Promoting Safe Infant Sleep Practices. Uh, both of these webinars are free to attend. They do require registration at cpsboard.org slash recertification. Uh, so please uh, you know, join us. We encourage you to do so. Uh, if we missed your questions, we will go back through the chats and look at them and make certain and follow up with you and certificates of attendance will be emailed out tomorrow. So thank you so much.